My name is Ashley, and this is Let's Talk Dispatch. I do. <laughs> You're gonna do it. Do it really well. And I believe the world needs more dispatchers. In the mud, blood, Plus beer. years that I'm not working Fourth of July. Fourth of July. <laughs> <laughs> hey, community <laughs> policing, right? What about community <laughs> dispatch? So on this show, with the help of my guests, we will educate, empower, and support the heroes behind the headset. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode here at Let's Talk Dispatch. And, you know, for this week, I have to say, uh, day shift for me is here. I've been, if you follow me on Instagram, you know I've been complaining about it, made a few dramatic reels. Um, my dispatch center, we sh- we switch our shifts every four months. And so on this turnaround, I got pushed off a graveyard and I have to go into a day shift. So I officially um, worked my last graveyard shift for this cycle uh, Sunday and I'm gonna be officially joining uh, you day walkers out there. And I'm not gonna lie to you guys, I, I'm a little afraid. And when I say I'm afraid, I'm afraid I'll like it. <laughs> more, more specifically, I'm afraid my body will like it because I've spent the past five, almost five years doing swings or graveyard the majority of my career. And because of that, I think this switch two day shift is going to do my body good, um, which is a great segue for my next guest here, Roger Sutherland, a healthy shift founder. Hello, Roger. How are you? Hi, Ash. How are you? That day shift, that dreaded day shift, hey? Oh, I am not looking forward to it. But like I said, I really am. I think my body's going to be like, oh, this is this is normal. This is what what you're supposed to be, be doing. Still 12 hours is long, but I think the switch to days is going to be going to be a good shift, but I'm, I'm still nervous. Oh, <laughs> uh, you, you have every right to be. I think I really struggle with day shift personally. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I find that I'm a lot more tired on day shift, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. And I, so if you've got a run of day shifts, yeah, I'm generally done by about the third one. I've had enough. <laughs> I completely agree. And you know, it's so funny that it's the same shift, right? 12 hours, but it's, it's that, getting up at 4 or 5 a.m. and then you know you're home you got to go through traffic to get home and then by, by the time you're home it's seven you gotta eat you gotta shower and then it's like bedtime <laughs> but on nights it's like i sleep till two i get a couple hours to lounge around even though it's the same amount of time it just doesn't feel as i don't know calm <laughs> and, it's, and it's not as productive ash i don't mm. think so either you know because yeah. when we are shift workers and we work shift work i think one of the things that we do tend to find is that we can pack so much into our day between nights because mm. we can get things done quickly and more efficiently i've just done a podcast on this actually about the advantages of doing shift work that mm. we can make appointments we can get to appointments in and out when other people can't and i do think that we we do, if we're regular shift workers, I think we do tend to find doing day shift, um, you know, breaking that sleep at 5 a.m. to get up. Yeah, that's that's ugly, isn't it? Like, Struggle. wow. Struggle. I, so <laughs> you know, and it's funny that we're doing this, uh, this today because last night I felt personally victimized by something you posted on Instagram because oh. it was 3 a.m. and I was scrolling because I was trying to um, I was trying to switch my sleep schedule because I got off Sunday so I slept my regular like till two or three yep. got up did some errands and then 11 12 came and I was like okay I have to go to bed now because I have to start getting ready to go to day shift on Thursday well 2 30 in the morning came and I was like well, I'm up. <laughs> and so then I was scrolling on my phone and I came across your Instagram post and it was like, oh, Oops. I don't, I'm tired. Let me grab my phone and stare at my screen. And I was like, it's like, he knows, he knows that we're, we're going to talk about this tomorrow. <laughs> uh, the, the reactions that I actually got to that one, Ashley, was unbelievable. <laughs> People, um, it gained so much traction because everybody relates, don't they? Like, mm-hmm. you know, as shift workers, when we've done a run of nights, and we come out of it, it's always the first or second night that we go to sleep and then, bing, we wake up wide mm. awake at 2 o'clock in the morning. 
And the tendency is literally, oh, I can't sleep. Oh, wow. Let's grab the phone and hold it a few inches away from our face and, and let's see if that bright light going into my eyes with all the information in the whole world can actually put me to sleep. Yeah, see, it doesn't work like that, does it? Yeah, it wasn't very successful. It wasn't very successful. No. So tell, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, uh, what made you reach out to want to come on to the, the show with me today? Uh, Ashley, I think the work that you're doing is fantastic. And what we need to do is we need to bring more awareness. Um, I've got a, an affiliation with um, um, uh, Police Dispatch. Um, my partner is a police radio dispatcher. Now, she's not raspy, but she's known <laughs> on the radio as well. So, um, and I was actually, you know, I said to you before we started, um, you know, why do they call you the raspy dispatcher? And it's funny because as much as you get to know the units on the road, they get to know you as well and look forward mm. to you being there. And, uh, you know, um, from a you know law enforcement background myself, I think it's kind of funny that when someone who you have an affiliation with comes on the radio, you just feel like, oh, I just feel so relaxed because that person's there helping me and mm. I know they've got my back. But um, going into that, so my partner's a, um, a police radio dispatcher. That's how I met her. And um, um, she's been doing it for 10 years. She absolutely loves her role, like you probably do as well. <laughs> um, mm. And, you know, she doesn't do shifts anymore. She used to do shifts, but she now does all the day shifts. But my my daughter is a uh, a dispatcher, uh, not a dispatcher. My apologies. My daughter is um, in law enforcement as well here, and um, she's um, operating on the road. Um, her fiance is also in law enforcement. My son is a fire dispatcher. He's just uh, graduated yeah. to fire dispatch from fire call taking here, um, and they work for a private company that we have here that looks after the, our uh, radio uh, call taking and dispatch or triple uh, zero it is here. It's not 911, it's triple zero. Okay, okay. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, so we have a private company that answers our calls and handles our radio dispatch, and then we have our police monitor the uh, the room to make sure, because it's a critical incident operation, so, and we're making decisions as well around that, so that's important. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the, um, the thing is, um, I've been around been in this environment for a long long time and i watched people really starting to suffer with their health as you know you can see people that come on board ash um and then in no time at all because they don't realize they're eating their chips and their chocolates and their lollies and they're eating that overnight there really isn't any guidance around what you should eat when you should eat how you should go about doing shift work at all and there's very limited research around that so what we want to do is break down what the research tells us we should not do and apply that to what we should do, you know, do, do try and do the direct opposite to guide us as to what to do. So, yeah. Um, so I live with my partner. She's a dispatcher. I'm completely surrounded by shift work. <laughs> and um, that's about my, my story. So that's where I, I end up doing what I'm doing today. Yeah, I mean, you, it definitely sounds like you guys kept it in the family with the shift work, uh, <laughs> shift work experience, which is yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, and I would imagine that kind of gives you a really, um, a really unique opportunity to really put the things that you are um, working with other folks into practice as well. Um, you know, kind of practicing on your family and like, let's try this out. How did this work for you and things of that nature? Well, it's really good, Ashley, because. You know, we've got males, we've got females, we've got, um, you know, like I've got a son-in-law and a son, I've got a daughter and I've got a partner and myself. So I get a, a, a good spectrum of different people trying to do it. And what works for some doesn't work for others, as you know. Like I can tell you what to do or advise you what the best way to go about it. It doesn't work for you, but it might work for majority of the rest of the population, you know. There's always that N1, that different person, you know, as well. So it does give me a really good insight. Plus, I coach clients one-to-one -one as well. So I really do get a really good overhaul of the, um, of the issues that people suffer from. That's awesome. So how did a healthy shift come about? How did it all start outside of just your experience with shift work? Mm. Well, to start off with, I, um, I'd worked 
in law enforcement for 35 years at that time. And I really did get to the stage where, you know, I'm getting sort of towards the retirement. I'm 58 now. So I was getting to the stage at 54, 55, where I was getting close to retirement. I'd done my own body transformation where I had lost a lot of um, uh, body fat. Um, I went into a great program and I started to develop a bit of a passion for nutrition, not develop a bit. I developed a massive mm -hmm. passion for nutrition. So I started understanding nutrition. Um, and then I looked around and I thought, how can I apply this and what I've done? Because I've done it at 55 as a shift worker. So how can I start to apply this to other shift workers to educate because I know that in the 35 years that I've done at that stage that there was no education for shift workers as to what to eat, how to eat, when to eat, and food timing, the chrono nutrition side of things. So what I did was I thought I'm going to go off and study and at 55 I went back to school and I went back to studying nutrition and I, mm. I studied at the gold standard um, uh, which is Mac Nutrition Uni, which is evidence-based because I wanted an evidence-based background, not bro science and what we think mm -hmm. works. Yeah. I wanted to know how to break down research. I wanted to know how to apply what research tells us we should not do to apply in real cases for people what we do do uh, or what we should be doing. Um, and I started doing that and I was studying at that time. I went through significant work stress at the time and, um, from within, and it caused me massive issues um, to the stage where, even as I, I was, even though I was fit and I was really healthy, um, the stress is an issue that really can get hold of you in a really big way. And you know that yourself, Ashley. You know you can have yeah. some shifts you can walk out at the end of the day, and you just feel like skipping to the car. And <laughs> other days, you can your feet feel like you've got concrete boots on, don't they? And you feel like yeah. you're absolutely drained or stressed and you're worried about units on the road you're worried about those members you're worried about those people you know you do take it very personally don't you yeah for sure yeah, yeah. so i i um uh, i actually suffered what's known as a tia which is a, a transient ischemic attack which is a minor stroke it's like a stroke that lasts um, less than 24 hours mm -hmm. and was rushed off to hospital and the paramedics that came and um and helped me um I then realized that I need to put health and well-being into what I'm actually doing as well. It's not about here's your calories, here's your macros, go away and do that. I needed to work on what are my five pillars of health for people. Mm. So I developed my own five pillars of health, which I'll go through with you in a second, mm. um, which if you put 1% into that bucket every day for each of those five pillars, you can actually start working really well to achieving, I mean, Shift work is less than optimal, but we mm -hmm. can we can optimise it for ourselves. We do need shift workers. Otherwise, no one answers that 911 call, do they? Um, and, and, and there's no one to tell the cops where to go. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so what we do is we, um, we need shift workers. So you bringing awareness to it and me doing what I'm doing and other people out there um, helping shift workers is enormously beneficial now to – you know, because if we've got shift workers there, if they're healthy and they're optimising what they're doing, they're actually at work providing productivity and supporting these agencies. Totally. And, you know, one of the one of the main things or reasons that I started reaching out and connecting with folks to bring them on to, you know, this type of show um, is because I don't have all the answers and people need I need people who are going and getting that evidence-based research and then breaking it down so people like me can understand it and make sense of it, right? If I go dive into a bunch of, you know, nutrition scholarly, scholar, scholarly <laughs> material, um, yeah. I'm not going to take away the same that you're going to take away because you're passionate about it. It's a language you understand. Um, so we need to connect with each other so I can get, all the info from you that you have available that can benefit me in my life and my shift work, right? Exactly mm -hmm. right. So you can be a mediator because you can bring sleep experts on. You can bring, um, you know, you don't have to be the jack of all trades, Ashley. Exactly. You, know? you, exactly. you, you can be the mediator bringing all the information to your dispatch cohort, which mm -hmm. is fantastic. So you can bring 
dietitians on, you can bring nutritionists on, you can bring sleep experts on, you can bring chrono nutrition experts on, you know, you can bring all sorts of people. You can also just talking to other dispatchers, Ash, you know, talking to other dispatchers and how they go about doing things. Sometimes these can be light bulb moments for people that you think, oh my God, I never thought about doing that. So true. So, so, so true. I think with every conversation I have, I take away even the simplest things. I'm like, yep. I don't know why I wasn't doing that before. <laughs> like, yeah. you know? It's so obvious. Some things are just so obvious. I know I've had um, guests on my podcast that I've got, like it's just been a brain <laughs> explosion. And I think, oh, my God, I've been doing this for 38 years and I still didn't know that. And this is why we need to be here. This is why we need to be bringing awareness to all of these sort of things. So, you know, um, yeah, it, it, it's very important. So let's talk about, can we talk about my five um, pillars of health? For, please, for please, people? yes. What yeah. are the five pillars? Yeah, so I've got five pillars of health, which I actually work with clients on. And these are very, very simple. Not always easy to apply, but these are very, very simple. Now, the first one is sleep. Yep, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't getting that last night when I was. <laughs> yeah, well, you weren't, well, you weren't scrolling. Oh, you were scrolling. But, you know, sleep is, it's the number one pillar. And the reason why it is the number one pillar is because it impacts in so many areas in our life, right? And it does. Now, a lot of people have massive trouble as shift workers sleeping. And there's a reason for that because we're totally out of sync with our circadian rhythm. Now, we have a biological day. We have a biological night. Now, who would have thought that the biological day is when the sun's up and the biological night is when the sun's down, right? The who moon's would have thought? <laughs> who would have thought? But you know, the bottom line is, even though we're out of sync with it, we can still build that sleep pressure to put us to sleep, but we have to create that environment. So in around sleep, we can do one percenters. And that one percenter, Ash, I'm going to call you out here. Looking at that phone, Mm-hmm. You know, we don't, we cannot with lies and we're looking at that phone, we're holding that phone a matter of inches from our face as we're looking at it. That light is actually triggering um, our, uh, uh, to simplify, triggering our brain to say, oh, you need to be awake. You need to be awake. Now you can be in a dark room, but that light directly on your, um, uh, I won't use the terminology, but the in, in the, you know, in your eye, that light is actually telling your brain, okay, we need to be awake, no sleep hormones, um, we're mm-hmm. going to be awake, we stay awake, that's it. So mm-hmm. that really does cause us all sorts of problems. So we need to put those phones away and we need to create a sleep hygiene, a routine to go to sleep. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're going to sleep in the evening before a day shift or whether we're going to sleep you know, at any stage or coming home from an afternoon shift or whether we're coming home from a full 12 hour night shift. If we keep that routine going and we build the habits on that routine, we can actually create that environment, you know, for our um, people to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if we keep the same routine going, it becomes a habit for our body to go, oh, okay, so this is what we do because we're going to sleep. No phone, blue light blockers, put on a sleep mask. Ladies, taking your face off and putting the creams on your face, mm-hmm. the smells of the creams and that routine, having mm-hmm. a shower, you know, a nice hot shower and then getting into bed and, you know, as our body cools, it goes to sleep. Mm-hmm. You know, that routine is what makes a big difference and that's just sleep. Yeah. Wow. You know, so, so, you know, there's a lot in it. But we can create that routine every time we go to sleep mm-hmm. because in the, in the words of Tom Coleman, who's a sleep expert, we actually don't have a sleep problem. What we have is a social priorities problem, <laughs> <laughs> which is so true. That and is we true. Do, we? we do because, you know, I'm sure you come home from your night shift and you think, oh, I'll just put a load of washing on and, oh, hang on mm-hmm. a second, what's that? Oh, I'll just get this meal ready for tonight. Oh, mm-hmm. I've just got to do this. Oh, I've just got to do that. And we do all these things that cause us grief. Now, the priority needs to be to go into that routine. So from mm-hmm. the time you leave work, put your blue light blockers on, drive home, go home, go around, leave them on, keep your phone away. You're not missing out on anything. I swear to God, you are not missing <laughs> out on going to be there the next day. But this is the problem. We have FOMO, don't we? Yeah, no. And I think one thing um, that that does occur, I think 
we are more likely to come out of our routines, especially yep. if we build good ones on stressful work days, right? That's so cool. mm. when I've had a normal shift, I'm probably going to be more likely to do do whatever my routine is, jump into bed. When I'm a little more amped, maybe I took a hot call right before the end of my watch and I'm driving home and I'm still, you know, up that roller coaster, still coming down. I think those are the moments where it's more challenging to stick to those routines. Totally agree with that. And, th and you know, and research actually shows that that is the time that it does fall apart. But when you look at it, why is it falling apart? It's because we're stressed. But mm -hmm. why are we stressed? Because our routine's falling apart as well. <laughs> Whereas that's the time we need to be in that routine, mm -hmm. practice our nose breathing, practice our breathing. There's so many different things that you can actually do. But when we are stressed, that's the time that we need to really focus on these habits that we build that gets us from that sympathetic state, that fight or flight, that stress, into a parasympathetic state. Um, so that we're more calm and we then mm -hmm. cope with that stress a lot better because I'm, I can just promise you, stress will get you, Ashley. Make no yeah. bones about it. You can be fit and healthy, but stress can cause you a, a massive incident very, very quickly, especially mm -hmm. as a shift worker with our biological um, markers in such a big mess as well. Definitely. So what is the second pillar? If sleep's the first, what is the second? Well, the second pillar is um, hydration. And you're mm. going to go, what? Hydration? <laughs> what do you mean by that? Hydration. That, you know, that's, that's, that's coffee, right? <laughs> <laughs> Bless. Yes. Yeah. That's caffeine. Oh, that's, water. that's water, isn't it? <laughs> Bless. I love that. Yeah, that's, so good. that's coffee, right? Um, hydration. Now, we need to be more hydrated than the regular mm. nine-to-fiver um, as shift workers because, and if you think about it, Ash, as a as a um, as a, a dispatcher, you're sitting there for extended periods of time. You're pretty much sitting mm -hmm. there for twelve hours. Now, I'm not sure how long you do in your spell of working, but um, you know our dispatchers here do an hour and a half, and then they have a half hour break. They do an hour and a half and have a half hour break. What do you do there? Uh, well, for lucky, <laughs> oh, <yeah>. we get <laughs> uh, we get pretty much our lunch is a thirty minute lunch, and then we get two fifteen throughout our day. Out our a whole shift. Hour shift. Yeah, I mean, you know, at the smaller agency, we have, if it's not slammed, you know, you can go off the floor, your partner can watch it, you know, yeah. there's yeah. a lot more um, flexibility. Non flexibility in it. Yeah. But as yeah. far as what, like, you're guaranteed, that's what we're guaranteed, you know, um, mm. during our shift, okay. which yeah. that's could use some help, for sure. <laughs> okay, so... So hydration is vital because you are very sedentary, Ash. Mm -hmm. So this is hydration, and I'm going to come to it because I want to talk about males versus females on night shift as well later. Mm -hmm. But um, I'll talk about the hydration now. It's really important that we have a higher level of hydration. We're more sedentary. So we need to keep moving everything through our system. So it's really, really important that we do keep um, that water going through our system to keep our system moving. So a high level of hydration. Now, before you ask, you're going to ask me, what is the, what, what's the um, standard um, amount of water that we need to drink? The magic number. What's the magic <laughs> number? Because we always hear, oh, you've got to have two litres or you've got to have mm -hmm. eight cups. But do you know the, re the, the research amount, the, the correct amount is actually just clear urine. If your mm -hmm. urine, urine's clear or straw coloured, then that's sufficient. That's enough water. At, even mm -hmm. at athlete level, that's enough water for you to have. So everyone, anyone listening, if you want to know how much water you need to drink, all you got to do is monitor urine. If urine's clear or straw coloured, you're right. No problems at all. Some people drink more water than others. You know, it's no good mm -hmm. me telling um, someone who weighs 180 pounds that you need to um, drink two litres of water. And then someone who weighs... Um, let's just say 120 pounds, you need to drink two liters of water because it's totally different, isn't it? Yeah, no, it really, really is. And I remember when I used to coach um, basketball, I coached high school and uh, I would tell my, to get my high school kids to understand that they needed to drink more water. Yes. Um, I would tell them, I want you to wake, to be waking up in the middle of the night, 
having to use the restroom, cursing me out because you, you're you so hydrated, you know? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and one of the biggest problems that we do have is for the people who, you know, follow this account for shift working things as well is it's very, very difficult for our um, our police and our paramedics because they're wearing PPE, they're wearing a lot of equipment, particularly the females. It's a lot harder for females to go to the bathroom, let's face it, than it is for men. And we, yeah. and we all know why, and we don't need to go into the details <laughs> around that, do we? But, but that's on our nighttime edition of Let's Talk Dispatch. <laughs> that's, the night, that's the nighttime edition. Yeah. Um, oh, there's some stories for that too, by the way. Yeah, I would imagine. Um, the thing is, the fact is, it isn't as easy for females to be able to go to the bathroom. So they they do avoid drinking. But the, you know, one of the one of the main symptoms of uh, dehydration is fatigue, and people who drink more and more and more water find that they be, find they're less fatigued. And also, the other thing that's important to know around hydration as well is. Because the sense is in the same part of our brain, we can actually confuse hunger for dehydration. So what mm. happens is we can think, oh, God, I'm hungry. Like, I really want something to eat. I need to have something to eat. But if you actually have a drink, you can find that that will um, – that can actually – oh, I actually wasn't hungry. I, I was just mm. thirsty. And you can drink and it can make a difference to you as well. So mm. so that's the – that's another – that's my other pillar, hydration. It's a symptom – um, dehydration is a symptom of fatigue. So it's one of those ones that's really important that we need to make sure that we keep our hydration high. Definitely. No, I, I thought, I mean, I, I've been through it where I'm three in the morning and I'm, I'm like, I'm hungry. Yep. I'm like, oh, I'm probably not. And then I drink and it goes away because a, we're just kind of bored and B yeah. we haven't been drinking for X amount of time. So your body's trying to get you to, to cue in, you know? Yep. And how easy is it, you know, like on night shift to board eat? And we do do mm -hmm. that, don't we, Ash? Like it's there's no secret of the fact that we can just sit there and just, you know, the vending machines mm -hmm. are there and we can just grab and eat and grab and eat. And, and it's mm -hmm. the worst thing that we can do, which brings you, me to my third pillar. And mm -hmm. my third pillar is actually nutrition. Now, everyone goes, yeah, yeah, Rog, I know, I understand it. But, you know, <laughs> There are things that we can do around nutrition which are important. Now, I know you've had Rainer on, so I'm not going to dance around and, and cover Rainer's, um, uh, what's she, the shift work dietitian. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not going to dance around on what Rainer's done because um, she does fantastic work with what she's doing. She's a dietitian. Uh, she's more qualified than I am around it. So um, let's not back over that, but we'll just talk about nutrition is my third pillar of health. Um, mm -hmm. And it's important. What I do do is I encourage the fast between midnight and um, 6 a.m., which is mm -hmm. really, really important that people have a main meal around 22.30 to 23.30 in particular, a good protein, carbon, fat meal, and then they literally try and fast from midnight to 6 a.m., which is really important um, because we, we our pancreas doesn't produce as much insulin. We're very insulin resistant. Anything that we eat tends to float around as glucose in our blood gets parked as body fat. That's the that's the science. That's the bottom line. So, whatever you're eating overnight, you can be pretty sure that it's going to body fat at that point in time, even though you're awake. Hmm. So something so simple, right? <laughs> that's one of those light bulb moments. Like yeah, yeah, you need a reason. <laughs> well, we need a reason. But but yeah. I, I I'm very very big on the overnight fast. I work with clients now. Look. Ashley, a lot of people go, I can't, I can't go all night, or mm -hmm. they can go from midnight to 6 a.m. That when they get to 6 a.m., they're canting it down 10, 9, mm -hmm. 8, oh my God, 6 o'clock. Now I can eat, bang, beautiful. And then they massively overeat. Now we want to avoid that because that's that's something that we must avoid. We don't fast or restrict at the cost of having a binge at the end of it because that's even worse, right? Yeah. And it counterproductive it can create really good, really disordered eating. So what I suggest is to people as they start to do this, and, and if you have a substantial meal about 22.30 to 23.30, <clears throat> sorry, it, we, um, we're in a position where we are quite full overnight really easily. Mm -hmm. We can board eat, but we've got to question that in our own mind. Am I mm -hmm. bored? Am I thirsty? Am I just eating for the sake of doing something? Um, 
But if you can't get through, we all know that by about 4 a.m. when we really crash, that it's time for us to have something to eat. And that's when you're reaching for those highly palatable carbohydrates and fats. That's a good time to have yourself something like a Greek yogurt with berries. You know, just to, to have some good Greek. It's a bit of protein. It slips through the system really easily. It's not putting any pressure on our digestive tract to actually eat, um, you know, to digest it. And it slips through, makes it nice and easy, mm. doesn't put any strain on our system. And then what happens is it goes through our system um, and it just satiates us again. And it gives us a bit of that sweetness that we're looking for as well, doesn't it? You know, that, yeah. That's, yeah. And that's what we are looking for because our body, is craving um, glucose. It's it's looking for an energy source, an instant energy source. Oh, my God, I'm tired. I'm so tired. Give me all the energy. Where do we get energy from? Glucose. Where does glucose come from? Carbohydrates. Give me biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> I would eat a biscuit at 2 a.m. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> oh, yeah. Have a biscuit. Give me a biscuit. Give me a, give me, a um, give me chips. I want chips. I want cake. I want spice. Yeah. Give me all the lollies. I want the whole lot. Give me everything, you know. That's and then half I'm... the time, our centers, at least here in the States, our centers, they have full kitchens. So yes. if 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 you didn't bring food, you could make a whole, you know, so it's not even. Yeah, yeah. You can make yeah. a gourmet dinner. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, um, but you know, even a bit of protein with a with a you know, cheese and crackers is ideal as well. A bit of protein with a bit of carbohydrate at the same time, so we get a little bit of energy. We're getting a bit of protein. We're getting a bit of fat. We're getting the whole spectrum there. So, um, and what I tell people is those baby bell cheeses. Now you can only take those. a couple because otherwise you just smash the whole packet. And that's less than <laughs> ideal. Um, but yeah, take a little bit and just have a little bit. So that's, that's a really good one. So that's my third pillar nutrition without, I just strongly support the fast overnight if people can do it. But if you can't do it, don't force yourself at the cost of a binge when you get home, but mm. then just fast overnight, have the yogurt and the berries or, or a little bit of cheese and crackers, a little bit of, you know, baby bell cheeses with a few little crackers to have just to tie you over until you can get home and have that carbohydrate, carbohydrate and protein meal before you go to bed. Awesome. Yeah. The next one, the next pillar is movement, which is really, really important. Now, movement is easy to say. And as you've clearly told me, you do it 12 hours, you get a couple of breaks and, you know, a bit of time for lunch. Well, lunch is to eat um, or not, which I've just <laughs> covered, but um, it's, to eat. but we do need to move. We need to keep moving. Our endocrine system is designed for us to move. Our body is designed to move so that it pumps the blood and, and move. Now, where we can't do that within our shift, we still need to do that outside of our shift. It's super important that we just take ourselves for walks and, and or move. Now, I use the term movement. I don't call it exercise because I think mm -hmm. exercise conjures up all sorts of in, images of having to put exercise equipment uh, gear on, grabbing a gym bag, filling a protein shaker, getting in the car, driving to the gym, playing with weights, then driving home again and then going and having a shower and then two hours is gone and I don't have time for that. So I don't, you know, that's why I don't call it exercise per se. I just call it movement because any movement is good movement and we can keep moving and just going for a walk. Now, research shows, and particularly for like dispatchers, and we're talking more to the dispatchers here, being vertical and forward motion is actually extremely good for your mental health. Or, and research is showing this. So if you can just take yourself for a walk. Now, don't set yourself a 10,000 step goal or a 12,000 step goal or 8,000. It's just irrelevant, right? Get up and go for a walk. Now, you don't have to carve out an hour either. If you can just go for a walk around the block, phone a friend. Just phone a friend and go for a walk and chat with your friend while you go for a walk fantastic go around the block a few times and then go home and then later on in the day go around the block a few times and then go home and what happens is i live on the mantra of action precedes motivation so you tend to find that once you've done that a few times it starts to feel really good and you start to feel better so you tend to do more and more and more of it until you start carving out and all of a sudden it's an hour walking and you just feel fantastic and then you start to feel lighter you know the burden of it's not the burden of weight. It's the burden of the mental weight on you. And taking yourself for a walk is just so beneficial. So I just suggest that people do a walk. That's, that's, that's my movement. I, I, I love that the idea behind that. So I used to play basketball in college and, I've, you know, back when 
I was chasing scholarships and trying to do the thing, we would work yep. out yep. weights, you know, more multiple works out workouts a day and all that good stuff. And now um, that I'm no longer a quote unquote college athlete, yep. I've had to really rewrite that idea of exercise and what that yep. looks like in my head because it is movement right it's simply yes. movement consistent movement and it doesn't have to be this long drawn out where i'm body lifting and doing full wind sprints oh. and it could just be something as simple as walking around the block chatting with a friend as you said which i think is <clears throat> see be super important uh for us in this line of work is as dispatchers to realize it can be that simple ashley we are fatigued we are tired right mm -hmm. and to go to go through the mental decision making of getting our gym gear on driving to the gym walking into a gym and doing weights and coming out now don't get me wrong i'm not making excuses because there are people out there that absolutely thrive on that and they mm -hmm. love it and all power to them but that doesn't mean that that Jenny has to do that and Ashley has to do that and Mary has mm -hmm. to do that because they might not be able to cope with that. It's not good for them. And it's not fair for the other people to say to them, no, no, this is what you've got to do. You have to do this. You don't. Just a simple walk. Phone a friend and go for a walk or listen to a podcast or listen to the Raspberry Dispatcher or <laughs> whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like, or the just, a Healthy Chef podcast. Or listen to the <laughs> podcast. Yeah, yeah. Kudos, kudos to that. But, you know, what I'm saying is we do put too much emphasis on exercise over movement. Vacuuming mm -hmm. the floor, mopping the floor, that's that's movement. That's important. Mm -hmm. um, even just going up to the shop and pushing a shopping trolley around. Let's acknowledge that that's a movement as well because there are a lot of people that crawl out of bed, crawl across the floor, go on the couch, sit there on the couch, smash a packet of Doritos, watching Netflix, and then go back to work again. See, that's that's a recipe for disaster. And then they wonder why they feel so miserable and they're depressed and it's also life is also oppressive. If you go for a walk, you'll be amazed at the difference that it makes. It's not about feeling a hundred percent fitter, but you will feel healthier all around. Yeah, totally true. Totally yeah. true. So, so that's that's number four. And mm -hmm. my fifth one is stress. And we have to manage our stress. Um, Ashley, it's really, really important because stress impacts in so many ways. And I added stress as my pillar after my um, episode um, because I was fit and healthy. I thought I was fit and healthy in a big way until I had the episode. And then what I did do was I um, decided to add stress and I've started researching and managing, um, managing my own stress to make sure that I am, you know, work fit for that. It's caused me all sorts of grief. So one of the things that's important, and I'll, t I'll just give you a very, very simple tip to anybody listening and for yourself as well. Notice that when you're working, if you're breathing through your mouth, then you are stressed, hmm. right? Because that's mouth breathing is pretty much a parasympathetic, uh, sorry, is a sympathetic state that we put ourselves in. Because one of the first things that happens is we open our mouth and we start breathing through our mouth. So to anybody that's out working in your emergency services, have a look at your colleague. And if they're breathing through their mouth, they're actually stressed. And if you're breathing through your mouth, you're actually stressed. Nose breathing is imperative to us. So if you're feeling quite overwhelmed with a, 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 um, a dispatch event that you're handling, you're feeling quite overwhelmed, literally close your mouth and breathe slowly through your nose in and out. Now, that's easy for me to say. Don't get me wrong, Ashley. I totally <laughs> understand that. But if you find, if you take a second to just close your mouth and start breathing through your nose, six, four seconds in, six seconds out, four seconds in, just take those breaths. You will feel yourself calming. You will literally mm -hmm. feel yourself calming. And, and um, it makes a massive difference to us because look around at your colleagues, look around at people. And if they're sitting about mouth breathing, it's not healthy for us to be in that state. Now, when we exercise and I'm talking exercise here, going for a run or we're doing weights in a gym or we're playing sport or something like that, mouth breathing, because we are in a sympathetic state. We're in a fight mm. or flight and that's mm. healthy for us at that stage. But we need to get back into that parasympathetic state 
um, very quickly. And we can do that by literally closing our mouth, breathing through our nose, four mm-hmm. seconds in, six seconds out. And you will feel yourself calming. And this is what like your SWAT teams and things like that do before they go to events. You'll mm-hmm. find that they're, they're nose breathing, box breathing um, and nose breathing. They practice all sorts of things to help them to stay calm as they're approaching these events, which really, really helps them. So nose breathing is the key. And I definitely think that, um, I mean, it's always easier said than done, right? But we have to really learn to do these things in the moment as well. So they don't compound and get, you know, heavier and heavier on us. If we can learn to manage our stress and we're not going to be perfect, we're not, you know, it's not going to be a hundred percent thing. But if we can acknowledge the the mouth breathing, you know, um, be very intentional of closing our mouths during that event and really focusing on that breathing like a like a SWAT officer would, yes. we're going to be better off in the long run at the yeah. end of our shift, you know, managing yes. our stress. Absolutely. Because it's, it's an exercise that we have to practice until it becomes a muscle memory as well. But if you're vigilant and you check in with yourself, and I always get clients, just check in with yourself. When you're going through one of these major events and it's stressful, check in with yourself. How am I sitting? Am I mouth breathing? Nose breathe. Close my eyes for a second. You know, I know, you know, you're talking all the time on the radio. I get that. Totally understand that. But those officers out on the road there are still dealing with that. You can take one second to just breathe through your nose and breathe out through your nose, breathe in through your nose, breathe out through your nose. You can just take that few seconds to calm yourself because when we are stressed, we've got more chance of making a mistake as well, Ashley. You know what I mean? Like when we're stressed, our brain doesn't function properly either because that's not, all it wants to do is get away from the problem that it's dealing with, get away. That's why it's called fight or flight, a sympathetic Mm -hmm. state, fight or flight. You know, I'm either going to stand here and fight or I've got to go, but I'm going to buckle up for, you know, that's why we find ourselves sweating. We find our heart rate increases. We breathe through our mouth to bring our heart rate up. All this happens. Close your mouth, breathe through your nose, and you'll find it will change, make a massive difference to you. So tonight, tomorrow, when you go to work tomorrow and you're on the channel, while you're sitting there, just check in with yourself. Oh, God, I'm breathing through my mouth. Mm-hmm. And just breathe, feel the calm. You will literally feel the calm coming over you as you breathe through your nose. Even though you're looking at the same screen, you're sitting in the same chair, you've got the same headset on, you're doing exactly the same everything. Just breathing through your nose, feel the difference. Come back to me on that. Yeah, no, definitely. I I, I look forward to it because it's just like I understand like being stressed and like uh, mindful breathing and things like that. But just the, something that's so tangible that you can look and go, or I can feel it and see and like without, even if I don't feel stressed, right. And it's just yep. my body's it's- natural tell. I mean, that's something we can all kind of take away and, and look for as an identifier for when we are stressed, even though we're not necessarily feeling it per Absolutely. se, our body is right. It, that's right. We may not mm-hmm. think we're in a stressful situation, but if we're breathing through our mouth, there's something that is stressing us somewhere as in, it's subconscious. It might be something subconscious. You might be subconsciously thinking about the row that you have with your partner or, or something like that. It could be anything, but I, I can almost, pre- I can pretty much guarantee to you, um, Ashley, that if you literally become vigilant and continually check in with yourself continually, and you know, it doesn't have to become a distraction, but if until it becomes a habit and it will, it definitely does become a habit. There's no doubt about it. It definitely becomes a habit that you check in with yourself. Okay, mm-hmm. this is stressful. Mouth breathe. No. Close my mouth. Breathe through my nose. Four seconds in. Six seconds out. You can just feel yourself calming. You can really feel yourself calming as you're doing it. And you're taking stock. You're just stopping everything going haywire and going crazy. And you find that you are literally taking stock and it will calm you. Um, and, and I think that's probably a really good strategy for all dispatchers because it does get very, very, very stressful, doesn't it? Oh, a thousand percent. I mean, and especially because I went from a, a bigger center to a smaller center, mm-hmm. um, the, the type of stress can be different, right? So yes. I have less call volume at my new center, but 
there's there's only me and my partner usually yep. and may, yep. if we're lucky a third so the stress is higher because there's only two of us doing you know this job that requires six you know so yeah. Yeah, that yeah. so it's just different levels of stress and being able to manage that stress yep. in every type of center and, and the other thing too, Ash, is the more experience we get, the more anxious we get about the next call as well, mm-hmm. don't we? You know, mm-hmm. like, you know, when you're first new, you, you, I mean, you, you're worried about, you know, Mrs. Tibbins' pussycat stuck in the tree, like, you know, big deal, that's a job, you know, like, so yeah. what? But, but, you know, as you get more experience and you've had some nasty calls that you've had to deal with, you do get to the stage where you can start to anticipate and start to feel a bit anxious about calls as well. Another Mm -hmm. way to control that is through your breathing as well. And as I said, it's one of the first things, or, you know, one of the important things that they teach you SWAT teams and, and, you know, forced entry teams and things like that. They do teach them these box breathing and this nose breathing to actually slow them down so that Mm -hmm. they make clear decisions and they're not clouded by stress. So that's, there you go. So that's my five. So there's the sleep, there's nutrition, there's movement, there's stress and hydration. They're the five. Mm-hmm. And if you can do 1% stepping in the right direction of each of those every single day, 1%, just 1%, just one tiny little step. How can mm-hmm. I improve my hydration? I'm going to carry a water bottle, but I can't get to the bathroom. I can still do this outside of work time as well. Do you know? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, just those one percenters can make a big difference stepping forward. You nail those five and you will be in a much better position around shift work. That's awesome. No, thank you so much for sharing that. I think they the the pillars that you've created are manageable and obtainable and simple. And I think for for shift workers, they need they need a little bit of all of that, right? In order to be able to give that one percent. Oh, outside totally. of their outside of their tired. <laughs> oh, <for> totally, sure. <laughs> totally. But the sleep impacts. I put the sleep as the umbrella over the top of the whole lot because it impacts so much in those other areas as well. And with nutrition, the one thing because I I um, educate clients on intuitive eating so it's not about here's your calories here's your macros this is what you need away you go monday we start here's your meal plans that's too overwhelming for people actually but one percent okay tonight i'm going to try to fast and i'm just going to take two baby bell cheeses and a couple of crackers in and just have that overnight i've got that to look forward to and i'm going to have that and i'm going to do that every night i'm on night shift until it becomes a straight out habit and I feel so much better for it and then you can start to implement something else because in 12 months time Ashley doesn't know the Ashley from 12 months ago because you're a totally different person by just Mm. doing those one percenters exactly exactly so what do you offer as a one-on-one coach like what what does someone who's coming to work with you what do they expect okay so someone that comes to me And what I do is I'm running them through the 10 principles of intuitive eating and people can Google what those are. Um, So if you, if people Google uh, the 10 principles of intuitive eating, you'll see that there's, there's all different principles. Now I work through those principles with people. Now I want to be clear. I'm not a certified intuitive eating coach, but I'm a certified nutritionist. So I've just learned that shift workers do not have the time to be taking photos, weighing themselves, doing measures, weighing their food, doing meal preps, doing everything. I want them to check back in with all of their, um, um, have more introspective awareness. So they've got more awareness of, am I hungry or am I thirsty? Am I, am I, where do I feel that? Is that what it should be? Is this what I should be doing? How should I be going about this? So what happens is, When they come to me, we step through that. So they get a worksheet from me, which is a very minor sort of worksheet. Some some clients, they don't feel like they're doing much, but we're actually laying foundations as we go. Um, It's a minimum 12 weeks with me to get the idea of what we do. But I've got a lot of clients that have been with me for six to – oh, some – some clients have been with me 10 months, um, and we're still going through. So every week – They do a check, they do a worksheet, which has only got like five or six questions on it or exercises for them just to check in with themselves. So they submit that to me on the Sunday 
And on the Sunday, they complete my check-in, which is done through an app on their phone. And on that app, I have habits. It's pushed to them to remind them to do them every day. And the habits might be to, when you wake up, have 500 mils of water. Oh, sorry, um, 500 mil. You notice before I use pounds, not kilograms. And now, <laughs> I've, been, now I've been caught out on mils versus, versus ounces. But about an eight ounce glass of water, I think it works out about eight ounces. Mm. Oh, I'm guessing here, Ash, Trust oh, me, I'm not, I'm not going to do the conversion for you. No, so. <laughs> no, no, me neither. I, I'm not going to get the Google machine out. But, but anyone, 500 mil of water when you first wake up to, to re energize your body to start off with, that's a good habit to get into when you first mm. wake up. <coughs> excuse me um yeah and i get people to do that so that forms a habit and once i've nailed that as a habit and said yeah i just do this as a matter then we take that habit out on a sunday they do check-ins which i've got questions which people um answer the questions that i i um i've i've got preset questions for them about what roadblocks did they hit where have they struggled where would they like help and then what we do is every every Monday, and because they're shift workers, it might be Sunday, it might be Tuesday, but um, and it, it rolls around depending on what their shifts are. On a Monday, mm-hmm. I have a half hour video consult with them where we work through the issues that they've actually had. So they get accountability, they get um, uh, me over the top of them helping them with any issues. The way I look at clients, Ashley, is. I imagine that they're on one mountain peak and I'm on another mountain peak and I've got to navigate them to me over all the all the terrain in between to get to me to where I'm at so that they have a better understanding. And at the same time, I get rid of all the bullshit around dieting and um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, exercise and what's got to happen. Because, you know, the bottom line is research shows that it's calories in, calories out. There is no doubt. It's about energy balance, full stop. But it's a lot more complex than that because you've got to fix the six inches between your ears before you can fix the six inches around your waist. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, That's and, true. Yeah, mm-hmm. it is. We've got to get that right because we all have, you know, one of the biggest contributors to disordered eating is body image issues. So many people have body image issues. And if you can teach people to to your dispatchers, oh, I'm a radio dispatcher. I'm charged with the responsibility I come into work, I sit there, I can talk on the telephone, I can operate a mouse, I can operate a keyboard, I've got a voice, I've got a brain that can think where to send units, how to send units, I can read a job. Hey, is that not something that's outstanding about your body? Mm -hmm. It's amazing. I mean, our job is so awesome. I I watch my partner when she... She's got the phone in one ear. She's got the radio in the other ear. She's got a foot pushing on the pedal. She's typing <laughs> on the keyboard and she's listening to the units. Are you kidding? How do yeah. you do that? I know she's female and females can do that, whereas, <laughs> male, whereas males can't. Oh, well, it's actually, I think it's called domestic deafness, but that's beside the point. Um, but we, you know, but that, I think that's just amazing. So instead of thinking, oh, I'm overweight and I need to look like that Fitzpo, what about you just acknowledge? Just what a superhuman, amazing person that you are doing what you're doing and how appreciated you actually are for doing what you're doing. That's how I work with clients, Ashley, you know, to start acknowledging positive body. Um, It's negative body image is not is not the direct opposite to positive body image. Positive body image is about acknowledge, acknowledging and embracing what our body does for us every single day. You and I are sitting here. We're, we're all over technology. I'm sitting here in Melbourne, Australia. You're sitting there in the San Francisco Bay region. We are communicating via this, helping people all around the world doing this. Is that not mm-hmm. amazing? It's, it's so cool. It's so and cool. yet we can sit here and feel like we're carrying a few extra pounds. Big. big <laughs> you know? You're absolutely right. Yeah, a thousand percent. Yeah, and that's why we need to we need to just let go of this how we're supposed to look, who says how we're supposed to look, who says how we're supposed to behave, who says how, you know, women, I think in particular, um, I think females, because I predominantly work with females because I'm all over women's health and I work very hard and well studied in women's health and I, because I, I think it's very important because um, women uh, do have a lot more issues than males do because it's a much more complex issue for them. But I think 
women, since they were eight years old, when their body starts hormonally changing, there's an expectation on them. This is how you've got to behave. This is how you've got to look. Oh, my God, my body's changing. Hormonally, I'm up, I'm down, I'm up, I'm down. Oh, what's going on now? One minute you want to stick an ice pick in someone's temple. Next minute you want to hug them. Do you know, it's it's a complex issue that we need to we need to just take the pressure off the females and, and acknowledge them for how amazing they are. They can have babies and they can raise children and they can – do radio dispatch and tell cops where to go and get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> so true. I definitely think that there is a um, a need to acknowledge, like, well, I always say that, like, once you learn to be a dispatcher, you can do anything, right? Because it's such yeah. a it's such a challenging job. I agree. Um, that you can't you can't just yank someone off the street and put them in our chair. It's it's such a learned skill. Oh, You're yeah. constantly learning, especially yes. with like technology coming and all these new advancements. We're just constantly changing um, in this realm. And you're absolutely correct that we need to really acknowledge the the su- superhuman yeah. abilities that yeah. folks have as dispatchers, call takers, radio dispatchers yep. in this field. I mean, it's phenomenal. That's exactly right. So let's turn it around and stop worrying about, oh, the uniform's got tight. Get the next size up. Who cares, right? Be comfortable while you're being superhuman doing the job that you're doing. It's not about giving up. It's just taking the constant reminder away from you and being comfortable, full stop. Mm -hmm. So, Ashley, that is literally how I work with clients, to change this perception of, of stop thinking, stop scrolling the social media, looking at, you know, females that are ripped with abs in bikinis, well, mm-hmm. you're sitting there doing something that they could not possibly do. That's their highlight reel. They can't. You couldn't drag them in, put them in a chair, put a headset on them and say, mm-hmm. right, do this. Because they couldn't do it. Just like you can't do what they're, gonna, what they're doing. So let's, let's just get rid of that and just acknowledge the fact that you're amazing. I love that. I, I, really, I really do, really do appreciate that. Thank you so much for that. That, that gym. I think it's amazing. And I think it's something that I, a lot of people need to hear, Yeah, um, you know, in this line of work, um, first of all, responders in general, right. Cause of all the stress and the, and the things that we take on, uh, no matter what role as a first responder you are in, you, I think we need to hear that more often than not right now. Agreed. Because everyone loves to ring and complain, don't they? But no one mm-hmm. turns around and says, hey, you're amazing. And I know people go, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a token to try and make me feel better. But I mm-hmm. literally work on that with clients. That's what I work on until people actually start to believe it. Because it's true. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. we need this pointing out and drumming into us that when you're driving to work and you've put the uniform on and you're thinking, oh, on Monday I've got to start a diet. Screw that. Don't worry about starting the diet on Monday. Get a bigger uniform or, you know, whatever you're wearing to work. Go into work, sit in that chair and be proud of what you're doing because that person that you just saw on Instagram, they can't do that. They can't do what you're doing. Definitely. So with that, I think that's a good segue into what advice would you give someone who is thinking about diving into a career such as dispatching or any first responder shift work type of career? I think one of the most important things for people in relation to that, without any doubt whatsoever, is have someone like me or a shift work coach that can guide you the best way to go about this, the best way to go about it, what the research is telling us so that we can break it down and help you. Get guidance early because it's much easier to start with the right foundations and work forward with that or work away from that negative place than it is to find four years down the track when you're totally burnt out, totally stressed. It becomes extremely overwhelming. So if someone is considering a job in dispatch, if you get through the selection process and get to the dispatch, first of all, I want you to be super proud of yourself Mm -hmm. for actually getting there, right? That's the most important thing because it is such an integral role. It is so important. And I know from an LEO on the road how important the dispatchers are to us at the other end. I know that, right? And people need to appreciate 
the more. And I think in the US, they probably do appreciate the more maybe than here. I'm not sure. Uh, I think they are very appreciated. It's probably much the same. But mm-hmm. um, And I think um, having visited the centres over there, it's a, it's a sausage factory. It's amazing. I, I was blown away by how it worked <laughs> in the US. Um, I visited the call centre in um, uh, Brooklyn. Oh, it's now moved to Queens. But it was in Brooklyn at the time. But Oh my God! I remember my eyes were popping out of my head. I couldn't <laughs> believe the difference. Like, like even though our island, our little island down here in Australia, is as big as mainland USA, we mm-hmm. don't have the population. But here I was in Manhattan and listening to radio around Manhattan. I couldn't believe it. I was just blown away. Like ninety-five <laughs> dispatches. I'm thinking, what? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it is it's <laughs> nuts. But you know, be proud of getting to that <clears throat> first. But the next thing to do is don't just go by, oh, what are Jenny, what are you doing? Oh, Mary, what are you doing? Find someone who knows. Find someone who understands it. Find someone who can help you to set you up into really good routines and good habits and stick with that because the temptations are there, aren't they, Ash? You know, as you move through, when you first started, there was no education. So you were looking at your mentor who was sitting there eating chips and lollies overnight and thinking, oh, well, this is what we do. And and then the weight starts to creep on and then you start to feel miserable about yourself and you think, oh, I've got to start a diet on Monday and, oh, you know, can't do this, can't do that. What's the best way to go? But I don't know, I'll just do this. So I think, that would be the best advice that I would give someone. Be fiercely proud of what you're doing. First up, first up, that's the first thing you should do. But then start nailing those pillars of what I spoke about and, and get help. If, if that's hard for you, get someone to hold you and keep you accountable and guide you from one mountain peak to the next so that you can really set some good habits for the future. Because as much as shift work is less than optimal, you can optimise it. That's that's great. Thank you so much for that, Roger. And thank you so much for coming onto the show, being willing to reach out and jump on with me. How do people find you if they want to work with you? I'm everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um people can find me on a um on a healthy shift on um at a underscore healthy underscore shift on Instagram. So if people wanted to come on and um, they can find me, I I can't help myself. I answer DMs and things like that. I would love to connect with people in the US. I would love for people to share me in the US mm-hmm. around that because I want to get to the stage where I start running health and wellbeing seminars, you know, um, worldwide to educate shift workers in their health and well-being around what we're going to do um, you know, around their optimizing shift work for them. Mm-hmm. Um, I also have a website where everything's on my website, which is a healthy shift.com. Um, you can find me there. You can find out all about me there, my coaching, um, what my coaching entails. Um, and also I've got some blogs on there um, and we didn't get to it, but there's a few blogs on there in relation mm-hmm. to um Uh, nutritional considerations for females performing shift work in particular, which Mm. I think people will find very, very handy. And there's also a free ebook on my website that people can actually download, um, which is um, why it's important for us to fast overnight and how to structure the overnight fast. It's a free ebook. It's on my website. I highly recommend that people go and get that, download it. If they've got any questions, by all means, come to me and I'm more than happy to help. That's awesome. And I'll definitely include all of those links and and fun stuff in the information section of these videos. Um, We also have a podcast for everyone who um, who I love podcasts. So yeah, well, podcast is the medium of the future. I used to do my walk and talks on my Insta story every day. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's hard. By the time you do it, you walk, you talk, you get <laughs> off it and people lose it, it's gone. <laughs> it's nice for people to go back to to, um, to podcasts. So what I did is I started my own podcast, which is A Healthy Shift. You'll see my smiling dial there, um, <laughs> yeah, A Healthy Shift. And what I do is I do... They released every Monday and Friday at 6 a.m. Australian time, which would be Sunday evening and Thursday evening for you guys in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Um, And I release those. So I have espresso episodes. So my first three episodes are espresso. They go for around 12 to 20 minutes. They're just short grabs around strategies around shift work. 
And then every every two weeks on a Friday, I have a guest interview which goes for an hour, like this, where I talk to people um, over an hour uh, around that are experts in their field, whether it's around body image, whether it's mm-hmm. around sleep, whether it's around circadian rhythms. And in fact, the one that I've got this week is Dr. Olivia Walsh coming up. She's a circadian rhythm expert talking about we're developing a shift app for shift workers to help them with mm-hmm. light, dark food exposures and movement exposure to help them to keep in sync as much as they can with their circadian rhythm so they feel better. And I've got that out being tested at the moment with 30 users um, and the, the data that's coming back is phenomenal. It's amazing. So we're developing an app, which is coming because, you know, we all love our phones. So we, we need an app on the phone. So, yeah, so I talk about that. That is so awesome. Uh, Again, thank you so much for jumping on with me. Um, I have learned so much in such a short amount of time. I can only imagine what people learn from you with listening to your podcast, working with you one-on-one. And I definitely am going to put all your information in there so we can connect with you. Thank you. I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to actually be able to speak to the raspy dispatcher and hear those, hear those tones. It's fantastic. Ashley, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. All right. I'll be right back with you, Roger. All right, everybody. That was another amazing episode here on the raspy dispatcher. Let's talk dispatch. Definitely going to include all of Roger's information for a healthy shift in the information of this video. So definitely Give him a follow, check out his podcast and his website. And until next time, everybody, stay raspy. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of Let's Talk Dispatch. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube at The Raspy Dispatcher. Follow us on Instagram and check out Let's Talk Dispatch anywhere you listen to podcasts. I'll see you next time and stay raspy.